Hey, Life Church, thanks so much for joining us today at Life Church at Home. Uh, glad you guys are here. I uh, wanted to encourage you guys to take a moment not only to watch uh, this service, but also to take a time in the middle of your day throughout the week uh, to remember that Jesus has come. Um, and in a season that it's especially, uh, we have a tendency to really feel alone because of all that's gone on this year, to remember that it's God who came near to us, that his name, Emmanuel, literally defines his presence towards us. So I would encourage you, as you celebrate Advent, uh, just to be able to focus on the joy that comes with knowing that no matter what goes on in the world around us, that he draws near to us. There's a link below that has a PDF of how you can participate in Advent at home. And Jen's got a couple of things uh, she wanted to share with you. We just wanted to, again, talk about one month away um, this is a, an initiative that our church has been a part of for about a year um, with Matt Willingham and City Heights, and uh, it's an eviction prevention program that um, in the last year, Light Church has helped keep over 140 people oh in God. their homes, and that's just, you can't even quantify what that what that fully means and it does mean everything for these families and so we just wanted to press in a little bit more in December and um, if you go to lightsandiego.com under the giving tab you can click directly to one month away and a hundred percent of that will go um, straight to families that need it right now yeah thank you guys so much and uh, also we just wanted to share some love right now um, with Nikita Curry she mm -hmm. has poured out faithfully yeah. um, with Young Light, with our kids' ministry for the last two years, two years, yeah. Over two um, years. serving in kids' ministry and doing an incredible job. Um, we, we're so grateful. We've seen the fruit in our own children's lives, yeah. and we know that you know in all the kids of Light Church, we love Nikita. We love Nikita. And um, they're not going anywhere. Josh and Nikita and William will still be a part of the community, um, but just not serving in this capacity. So if Nikita has directly affected your life in any way, your children's lives, um, I'd encourage you to write her a note, write her a thank you card, say something that has directly impacted um, your lives uh, through, through her outpour. Yeah. So we love you, Nikita. We do. Thank, Thank you so you. much for all you've done. Um, well, before we dive into the sermon, we have some time of worship. But when the sermon turns on, I will not be there. Um, and we're, one thing we're really excited about is Josh Burt, um, our youth pastor, him and his wife Amber, um, faithfully take care and shepherd um, our young people. He's going to be speaking today. Um, I already got to watch the sermon, and it so not, good. not only was it good, it literally was exactly what I needed to hear. Exactly. And I'm confident uh, mm -hmm. that it's going to be a blessing to your guys' hearts as well. So uh, make sure that you guys stay tuned for that as well. We love you guys. We do. Uh, let's get our hearts ready to worship the Lord.
Hello everyone, if we haven't met yet, my name is Josh and I help lead Youth in Sanitas with my wife Amber. This is our junior high and high school ministry here at Light Church. And one of the many blessings I get to receive every week we meet is that I experience the joy that radiates from the hearts of the young men and women of God. And the reason I bring this up is because when Benji asked me to help speak and participate in the Advent series that we're going through, he also let me know that it would be on the week of joy. And as soon as I heard this, I looked at him and said, you know, we just entered into purple tier, right? And it was this kind of comedic relief. But in that moment, I realized that joy can be so different from the traditional sense of the word happiness that we have used in our daily lives. Um, and one of the differences that we see between joy and happiness is that joy is an emotion that can be had with other emotions. So instead of happiness, where it's pretty difficult to be happy and sad at the same time, we see that joy can be present when you're sad. Joy can be present when you're excited. Joy can be present when you're shocked. And because these words can go hand in hand, think of the greatest moments of your life. Maybe it was when you got your first car or you graduated. Maybe it was your wedding day or even the first time you saw your kid. And the emotions were so overwhelming that you couldn't just say you were happy, but rather this phrase might have came out saying, I am full of joy. So I think it's very important as we look into joy to define what the joy, what the lenses we will be looking through. And the way we'll be looking at it this week is a joy that can only come from the Holy Spirit. We have um, been in today's world, we see that words can tend to change their meaning over time, uh, depending on trends and different cultures and the way they use the words. For example, the word nice, if we look at its original meaning in Latin, it stems from the word nescius, which is ignorant or foolish. And of course, nowadays, we wouldn't call someone that is unaware or not quite sure what's going on. We wouldn't call them nice. But we see that over time, words can begin to look a little different and they can begin to sound different and have different meanings. And it depends on the context, which gives definition to the word, because words might not have an intrinsic definition in themselves, but it depends on the culture that surrounded um, the context behind it. So as we're looking into joy and this joy that comes from the Holy Spirit, we actually see a verse in Galatians chapter five that says, peace, love, joy, patience, kindness. These are fruits of the Spirit. And if you're thinking, okay, if this is, if this stems from the Holy Spirit, if this is where we receive joy, what are some practical ways we can do that? And we're going to get into those before we get into the message. And sometimes this can just look like a warm cup of coffee, um, overlooking God's beauty, whether you're at the beach or a lagoon and you're seeing God's creation. This can look like a Lectio Divina, where you just allow the Word of God to refresh your soul. This can also be a prayer walk if you want to go and exercise. And all these are little ways throughout our day where we can come and experience the joy of the Lord. But the joy itself that I think is very important and the way we're going to be looking at it today is through an apostle named Paul. Because sometimes we may be sitting here this Christmas season and it can be the most wonderful time of the year or it can be the most painful time of the year for some people. And we see that in Paul's life, if we were to put a rank on who was the most suffering or who really just had it rough in life, Paul would probably be near the top of the list. And here are some examples in Paul's life that we see. Um, one is when he is going into his second missionary journey to Philippi. He stumbles across a female slave that was demon possessed. And as he's casting out this spirit, we see that he's doing a good thing, but the owners of the slave are furious because 
This was the way they received income. They were calling her a fortune teller and pickpocketing all the money. So eventually Paul's thrown in jail. And then we see another time when he is out of jail that he is in the midst of these temple courts and people are telling the Roman authorities that Paul has brought in a Gentile to the temple courts, which was a no-go. What had happened was because they saw Paul with a Gentile before, um, they just assumed that he was in the inner courts. There was an area on the outside what, which was called the court of the Gentiles, meaning the non-Jewish people. But if you were to get more and more in the center, you would find that it was considered holy and holier, and Gentiles were not allowed in this because it would have been considered defiled. So long story short, Paul ends up going trial after trial. He's going into house arrest and we find him in prison. And this is where we see Paul writing these letters most commonly titled the prison epistles and while he's in prison he writes a few of these letters and the one we're going to be focusing on today is the book of philippians now the three points if you're taking notes that we are going to see from the life of paul is one that joy is present in the midst of suffering two there is a joy that lasts even through the hardships and then three there is um the realization that joy is a gift. So beginning with point number one, joy in the midst of suffering, we see Philippians chapter one and verses 12 through 19 that we'll be looking through. It starts by Paul saying, I want you to know brothers that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. And you may be thinking, how is being in prison an opportunity to advance the gospel? Well, if we continue on to verses 13 and 14, he gives two ways that him being in prison has actually brought a furtherance of God's word and a furtherance of God's kingdom. It says, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ, verse 14, and most of the brothers having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So number one, all the Roman soldiers who are relieving one another and um, watching after Paul as he is in this cell are beginning to hear what's taking place because Paul wasn't in prison for an evil act that he committed. He didn't commit a crime, but they began to realize that, oh, Paul was actually in prison because of what he was trying to do for the Lord. And then it says the rest of the people, um, meaning all of those who were curious about the trials and listening to the local news and figuring out like, what is this all about? They began to hear what was taking place as well. And then the second way that this advanced the gospel is it says most of the brothers having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment. You may have heard someone's story before. You may have watched a movie. And as soon as you walked away, you felt so encouraged. You thought, if they can do it, I can for sure do it. And we see this taking place when they're looking at Paul's story. They are finding someone that they can partner with, finding a group of like-minded thinkers. And I'm sure that we can both uh, relate in this moment. But what I want to make very clear is that when Paul is writing this, what he's not saying is, I'm going to wait to get out of prison to find joy. No, he's saying, I'm going to rejoice in the middle of it. Even when I'm still in the mess, even when I'm still in the hardships, I'm going to find a way to rejoice, which leads us to point number two, a joy that lasts. And verses 18 through 19, it says, yes, and I will rejoice for I know that through your prayers and the help of the spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. We may be sitting on the edge of our seats thinking, how is this story gonna end up? We see that it's advanced the gospel. He's saying, I am gonna be delivered. We're waiting for someone to break the walls down. Maybe someone has a secret key to unlock Paul and free him from the chains. But to be honest, I think it's so much more than him just making it out of prison because the word that Paul uses for deliverance is this Greek word soteria, which often is translated salvation. So no longer is he looking at this physical deliverance, 
but it's an eternal deliverance of when Jesus came, that now he has hope and a joy and a savior, knowing that even after his life, he will still be delivered um, from death. Death will not have the final say, but Jesus has come, so in that he rejoices. If you're thinking to yourself, okay, well, we know that we can rejoice in an afterlife. We know that we can rejoice after our physical life has ended. But how does this, how does this take place in a phys like in our life today? How can we figure out where we are able to find joy at this moment? Well, we see Paul say this in verse 18. He says that he is rejoicing when Christ is proclaimed. And I don't think proclaiming isn't always just standing on a corner with a picket sign. No, it's when Christ is in the spotlight. We see an example of this in John chapter 3, where a dilemma arises and John's disciples, who are looking to bring a beginning to the kingdom of God and usher in Jesus and his ministry, we see this take place right before, and we're going to read it in the message translation to get a little summary, but it says, They came to John and said, Rabbi, you know the one who is with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you authorized with your witness. Well, he's now competing with us. He's baptizing too, and everyone's going to him instead of us. John answered, It's not possible for a person to succeed. He says, I'm talking about eternal success without heaven's help. You yourselves were there when I made it public that I was not the Messiah, but simply the one sent ahead of him to get things ready. The one who gets the bride by definition is the bridegroom and the bridegroom's friend, his best man, that's me in place at his side where he can hear every word is genuinely happy. How could he be jealous when he knows that the wedding is finished and the marriage is off to a good start? That's why my cup is running over. This is the assigned moment for him to move into the center while I slip off to the sidelines. The King James Version phrases it like this. This is my joy, therefore fulfilled. He must increase, but I must increase. We find joy when Jesus is at the center. And a practical way we can do this is sitting around a table breaking bread with our family members, our roommates, sharing of the goodness of God, the faithfulness that he has pulled us through, reminding one another of what we believe in and this creator that is good. We also sing songs like joy to the world during this season. Um, and if we listen to the lyrics, it goes joy to the world, the Lord is come. And so many times, we kind of overlook that sentence. Where does the joy come from? And we begin to look for other sources where we could find joy. We begin to try to find it in our job, um, our friends, sometimes it, a hobby or things like that where we can become happy and have good emotions. But this true sense of the word joy and this true fulfilling, we see that it comes when the Lord was present. We understand that as we receive this gift that was a savior, a Messiah that saved us from the world, this is where the joy comes from. And this leads us to our last point, our point number three, which is joy is a gift. You may remember a gift um, that someone has given you, maybe it was Christmas morning or your birthday, and it just left you in awe. For me, this was the time right after my wife and I got married, her mom ended up gifting us a puppy. And as soon as we saw this seven week old, one pound French bulldog, we couldn't help but just be mesmerized. Our hearts melted. We started getting him little outfits. We got a diaper bag. And I was living the best dog dad life I could. And then I soon realized that dogs don't come puppy trained, or sorry, dogs don't come potty trained. Dogs also begin to have a fear and an anxiety because they are separated from their litter. So this then began the many sleepless nights where this joy that was a gift soon needed to be exercised. And I love the way Henry Nouwen puts it. He says, joy does not simply happen to us. We have to choose joy and keep choosing it every day. 
We soon after we got that puppy, we had to start training him, letting him know that he could not just go to the bathroom wherever he wanted to. We had to start taking him on walks to get his energy out so that he wouldn't take it out on our furniture. There's so many things that we ended up having to work through and fight and strive because what was a gift now after was beginning to get worked on. We needed to start refining it. Romans chapter three, verses 21 through 25 says this, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. I read this verse because when Paul is using the word joy, the Greek um, way he phrases it is kara, which stems from the word charis, meaning grace. And we see here that grace is a free gift. And what a beautiful remembrance that uh, just as grace is a free gift, we also receive this joy that is free for all of humanity. This joy that comes from the Holy Spirit, this joy that uh, we can practically live out in our day to day, but also a hope and a joy in what is to come and a joy that the Savior brings. If you're following along with us in our Advent series and we take some time to do Advent at home as well, you'll notice that we are going through the book of Luke. There's a couple of days that talk about Luke chapter two, and this is the story when the shepherds are in the middle of the field and out of nowhere, they see this bright light and an angel of the Lord appears to them and says, do not be afraid. Pause real quick. When I hear do not, do not be afraid, I think to myself, if something was to happen to me, those would probably be the last words I wanted to hear. Imagine if I were to say something to one of my friends that really just frustrated him. And now whether if I did it on purpose or not, it would be not the right thing to say, hey, don't be mad, don't worry about it. But I don't think that the angel is trying to discredit their emotions, but rather what he's doing is bringing them this good news. So instead of just saying, do not be afraid, he finishes it and says, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. In this Christmas season, wherever stage of life you're in, may, you may be in a season where you're hurting, um, you're grieving the loss of maybe a loved one, a job, maybe it's the loss of reality, where you had so much plans for 2020 that have soon slipped through the cracks and have been completely erased. Now you're thinking, what else do I have to offer? This, this was what I was living for. Can we be reminded this Christmas season as we're looking at these shepherds who are full of fear, not knowing what's going on, that there is a savior who brought joy that can be present in the midst of suffering. There is a joy that lasts beyond just your physical day to day, but and through the suffering, through the hardships, and that there is a joy that is a gift, a free gift that is given to all of humanity. Let's pray. Jesus, we are so humbled to be your creation. We are so um, thankful that we have a Savior who has come and has delivered us from death. I love the way Paul says that even in the suffering, he will rejoice because he knows that it will further the gospel. This Christmas season, would we realize that you are the one who brings us joy. Christmas morning, would it not just be a high flood of emotion and then the first week of New Year's when something doesn't go right, our New Year's resolutions don't succeed, where it just totally falls but would this joy be an everlasting, ever-present opportunity where we can come to you and say, no matter what I'm going through right now, I put my trust in you 
knowing that I find my joy in a Savior named Jesus. So grateful for the opportunity that we have to be in your presence and take place in this joy. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. fails me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God all my Good. Mm-hmm.